If we continue on our current course, we are headed toward a crash from which there can be no industrial recovery. These are the words of energy expert and Post Carbon Institute senior fellow Richard Heinberg, author of a new book, Power, Limits and Prospects for Human Survival. Is there another way forward? We'll explore power next. Calling, 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 calling. Call the growth buster. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Welcome to the Growth Busters podcast, where we hold your hand as you come to terms with limits to growth. We've outgrown the planet. We've hit the limits and gone beyond. That rubber band is going to snap back, and we'd best figure out how to shrink the scale of the human enterprise before Mother Nature does it for us. I'm Dave Gardner, director of the documentary Growth Busters, Hooked on Growth, and chief scientist here at the Institute for Advanced Growth Addiction Studies. You'll find us at growthbusters.org. Search for Growth Busters on Facebook, Twitter, and of course, your podcast app for the latest growth busting news. Before we get to the heart of the matter today, I want to give you an update on my daughter, Stephanie. If you listened to our last episode, you know that Stephanie co-hosted with me. And it was kind of a trial run, and uh, she's decided she liked it, and she did a great job, and we've gotten some good feedback. So Stephanie is going to be welcomed as my new co-host, but not today. Stephanie couldn't join me for this episode, but look for her in the future. One last thing before we talk to Richard Heinberg, some important growth-busting news. Ten years ago, at the end of this month, on October 31st, 2011, we passed through the 7 billion milestone for world population. Now, I chose that occasion to release the documentary Growth Busters Hooked on Growth, and we held our world premiere a few days later, November 3rd, in front of a standing-room-only audience in Washington, D.C., now, over the past decade, many viewers of the film have implored me to make it free. Uh, I've resisted up to this point, but the 10th anniversary, well, that seems like the right time. But that means we'll be giving up revenue from screening fees and sales and rentals of the film. So, during the month of October, will you please help me raise a very modest $10,000 to help, just to help, cover the cost of continuing Growth Busters initiatives. I'm talking about initiatives like paying for some YouTube ads to increase views of the film, doing some other outreach to attract viewers, producing this podcast, creating and delivering presentations at conferences, on college campuses, and to church and other groups, making guest appearances on news programs, talk radio, podcasts, TV programs, and documentaries, producing some new short films for YouTube, producing an occasional Conversation Earth radio slash podcast special. And finally, I can't believe I've gone 10 years and haven't done this already. Shame on me. Finally, I'm going to create a music video for the fantastic Growth Busters theme. That's the music that you heard at the beginning of this podcast, and you'll hear a little more of it at the end. But few people have ever gotten to hear the whole thing, and it's really well done. The lyrics are great. And uh, so I'm going to finally put together that music video. All these things take money. So help me out. See the show notes for the link to the crowdfunding campaign, or write it down or open a browser window right now if you prefer. Here's the URL. It is fundraiser.com slash growthbustersmovie. Now, fundraiser is spelled oddly. It's F-U-N-D-R-A-Z-R. Fundraiser.com slash growthbustersmovie. Okay, now for the main event. Richard Heinberg. This guy is, one, brilliant. Two, senior fellow at the Post Carbon Institute. Three, author of 13 books, including Power Down, The Party's Over, and my favorite, The End of Growth. His newest book, just published, is Power, Limits and Prospects for Human Survival. Newsletter is his monthly newsletter that is some of the sharpest thinking and communication about what's going on in the world. I'll put a link in the show notes. It is richardheinberg.com slash newsletter. If you don't go to the show notes, and you can write that down quickly. Before I bring Richard in, I want to share three very brief passages from the new book, Power, just to set up this conversation. The past two centuries have seen the most rapid, wrenching, cultural, ecological, and even geological reordering in the history of our species. 
The bigger the scale of our collective human metabolism, and the faster it grows, the more we deplete the environment. We are now using nearly every natural resource faster than nature can regenerate it or technology can substitute for it. And the impacts from having accumulated too much power are now legion, including climate change, the proliferation of highly lethal weapons, pollution, habitat destruction, propaganda, extreme inequality, population growth, and resource depletion. Now back to me. Is there a way through these challenges to a more beautiful existence on our home planet? Let's find out. Richard Heinberg, it's been a while since we talked. It's really great to uh, be with you again. And, and first, let me just say thank you for all you have done and all you continue to do for our planet. Oh, well, thank you. That's very kind, Dave. And thank you for what you're doing. Well, you're welcome. And, and uh, thanks for saying so. <laughs> Yeah, well, thanks for hosting this uh, podcast, and thanks for inviting me on. Well, it's uh, <laughs> you are uh, you are not to be missed. It's important to have your presence uh, as often as possible. This isn't the first book you've written, Power, that we're talking about today. Is this just one more book by Richard Heinberg, or do you see it as something bigger? Oh, this book is something special. I've been working on it for several years, and I think it's kind of the culmination of my of all of my efforts as a researcher and writer uh, going back decades. It, it brings everything together and in a way that I think clarifies our human predicament in the 21st century in, in a way that I, I haven't seen done elsewhere. Well, that's fair to say. And, you know, you don't just start 200 years ago, that's for sure. It's a pretty darn comprehensive history of right. certain aspects of human civilization, that's for sure. In fact, it just blew my mind. So I wanted to ask you, roughly, how many books and how many scientific papers would you say you read and synthesized in order to write this book? Was it a gazillion or two gazillion? Uh, it was about nine fantastigillion, three billion, jillion, centrifugillion, and uh, 16. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> So something like 100 million to the power of 10. <laughs> yeah, right. No, seriously. This was an intellectual journey of a lifetime. I've been interested in all of the subjects that, that relate to this book for a long time. Anthropology, evolutionary biology, uh, human history, uh, economics, energy, politics, all of those things. But I realized I was pretty stale on some of them. So what I did was to go out and search for the, the latest, best thinking in each of those fields. And that entailed, you know, buying literally scores of books and scouring the Internet for research papers and so on. And uh, it was months and months of just bringing myself up to speed. And it was, you know, for somebody who enjoys learning new things, this was, <laughs> I felt like a kid in a candy shop. I could tell that, that you just have this fascination and uh, uh, great curiosity. Otherwise, there's no way you could have written all this. History has always been a tough subject for me, and it goes way back to boring history teachers in high school. So you provided me uh, with a lot of history that I'd never got anywhere else. So thanks for that. Now, because of all of your past research and writing and expertise about energy, uh, one might assume that a book called Power by Richard Heinberg is about energy. But you don't even really mention energy, I think, until chapter four. So clearly energy isn't the primary focus here. Well, it, the book is about power, and one of the key definitions of the word power is the rate of energy transfer. And this helps us, I, I think, understand why energy really is significant, not just in you know contemporary politics, climate change discussions, mm -hmm. and so on, but it's essential to understanding everything. It's essential to understanding how nature works, how how cells work, how our own bodies work, how human societies work. There's an the old saying, you know, um, if you want to understand some political scandal or something, follow the money. Well, if you want to understand anything about how nature works, follow the energy. So by bringing power in this physical sense, having to do with energy transfer, together with power in the other ways we use the word, social power, how 
some people are able to influence others and, and so on. By bringing all of those two things together, I thought it was really, you know, a kind of a revelation in my own mind and uh, hopefully in the readers too, because discussions about social power, which usually just focus on money or political office or something like that, mm -hmm. tend to leave energy completely out of the discussion. Yeah. And I don't think it should be left out of the discussion. It's central. Interesting. Well, you went to great lengths to research and consider how Homo sapiens became the most powerful species on the planet. There's a, a news flash. Did you know that, listeners, <laughs> that we're the most powerful <laughs> species <laughs> yeah, on the right. planet? What a surprise. But in a nutshell, how did that happen? How did we get the prize? And I know that it took a book to tell us about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the story starts way back in, in the uh, Pleistocene as humans evolved, and it has to do with familiar accomplishments like the ability to control fire, uh, to make tools, and mm -hmm. of course, language, which is the, probably the most important of all, because having language enabled us to teach each other how to use tools and how to make more sophisticated tools. And it enabled us to ask questions about the future and the past and what may or may not even exist. Uh, so language was a, was a huge power development in, in the history of our species. But then the question then of how some people became more powerful than other people takes us into the next phase of the conversation, which is the Holocene period, the last 10,000 years with the development of social inequality. But that's, that's a whole other story. But then the, the development of human power obviously continues right up to the present. And, and as technology uh, advanced, as uh, our ability to control fire advanced, we got to the fossil fuel age just a couple of hundred years ago, where burning stuff enabled us to unleash tens of millions of years of ancient sunlight stored in fossil fuels. <laughs> and that has given us by far the most power over the natural world to the point where now, just through mining, uh, mostly mining for gravel and, and uh, sand as well as minerals and so on, just through mining, we move more of the Earth's crust than all natural processes put together, wind, rain, ocean currents, glaciers, you name it. So yeah, we are the most powerful organism on the planet by far. And of course, my point in the book is that this, this is a perilous kind of power. We're overpowering nature. Yeah, we're so powerful now that we've basically brought the planet to its knees and ourselves to the brink of extinction. Any further comments on that? You're doing a great job of doing cliff notes for the book, although if anybody thinks that they can cheat and just listen to this <laughs> podcast and skip the book, you can't do that. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the book is a story. It's a story of how we got to this point, and there's a lot of interesting you know, turning points along the way. For example, one of the great energy transitions of our species was the development of agriculture. You know, food is a primary form of energy. And um, I didn't really understand in so much detail until I started working on the book the incredible role that grain agriculture played in the transformation of, of human societies. There's a, a, a wonderful book called Against the Grain by James C. Scott, who's a, a Yale anthropologist, historian, that uh, really brings all the recent research on this subject up to date. But uh, very briefly, people started growing grains largely as a result of population pressure and increasing warfare. Grains made it possible to feed more people on a, a limited area of land. And so grains also then created a different way of living because they could be taxed. They could be stored and taxed, unlike, you know, food that pre people were previously accessing. And once you had taxation, then you had the possibility of complex societies with kings at the top of the social pyramid all the way down to slaves at the bottom. And with people then specializing in different occupations like making weapons and uh, and keeping track of accounts 
becoming accountants or soldiers, full-time specialists in violence, then these kinds of societies became uniquely powerful in relation to other human societies. And so they started taking over uh, living space from indigenous people surrounding them on the periphery. And that's been going on all the way up to the present with you know the, the European conquest uh, just 500 years ago, the, the most significant example of that. But it, it all traces back to this turning point, you know, 8,000 years ago or so, of the development of field agriculture. So it, it just shows how, how so much can shift as a result of just one thing. And in the book, I identify several of these big turning points, some of which I think we don't really pay enough attention to, like the shift to fossil fuels. Yeah, because I, I got the impression from the book that if we were to just turn the clock back 8,000 years and take a different direction, we probably would have ended up somewhere in the, in the same boat, I bet. What do you think? <laughs> Somehow. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Without the development of, of grain agriculture, I think we, we probably would have ended up in a very different boat, actually. You're going to have to quit contradicting me like this. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Just kidding. No, I'm glad you are. I can take it. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Especially if we hadn't taken the turn a couple of hundred years ago toward fossil fuels, we certainly would have ended up in a very different boat. Yeah. And this actually almost happened about a thousand years ago. The Industrial Revolution almost happened in China. It was starting to happen. China had a lot of coal. There was a privatization of land and resources going on, invention of all kinds of new technologies. You know, really all the, all the uh, ingredients of an industrial revolution. But what happened was the government saw all this furious development of industry and said, well, this is going to be a threat to our political power. So they shut it down. And instead it happened in Britain, you know, 700 years later. And the rest is history. But fossil fuels changed everything as a result of the massive amounts of energy available from fossil fuels. Our population has grown from 1 billion in 1820 to 8 billion today. Well, technically 7.9 billion. Mm -hmm. And our per capita energy usage has also grown 800%. So per capita and also the number of capitas expanding dramatically and our control of, over nature and our <laughs> our very negative influence on nature, our rapacious, uh, destructive influence on nature has also grown astronomically during that period. Well, obviously, you couldn't write the book without at some point cataloging uh, many of the unfortunate consequences of us having all of this power. And I'm not going to ask you to recount that now. And people get that from people like us frequently anyway. But I wonder if you could kind of big picture share what you see us facing now as a result of wielding all that power. What is before us? Well, this century is probably the biggest, well, bottleneck since the origin of our species. I and mean, we've gone through some difficult times before and with uh, plagues and famines and, and so on. Mm -hmm. But this century, it's really all coming to a head. We have built a way of life, an industrial way of life that is uh, inherently unsustainable for a number of reasons. It's founded upon fossil fuels, the energy of fossil fuels. And of course, fossil fuels are finite. They're depleting in real time and burning them causes climate change. Meanwhile, the side effects of industrial expansion include the disappearance of wild nature, something like 70% of the vertebrates and insects, fish, all have disappeared in the last 50 years. The earth is becoming more polluted. And, you know, it's not just a matter of soot in the atmosphere. It's, it's uh, plastic microparticles. It's the uh, hormone-mimicking chemicals that are spread throughout the environment yeah. that are decreasing 
human fertility causing male sperm counts to plummet toward zero, possibly in the next 15, 20 years. And all of these things are converging and they are all the result of a good thing, which is human empowerment. We have become immensely powerful. Power is a good thing. You know, without power, we can't do anything. It's the ability to do something. We talk about the power of speech, the power of flight, you know, the ability to do things is great. Power is good, but you can have too much of a good thing. And that's essentially where we are right now as, as a species. We have over empowered ourselves vis-a-vis -vis nature and some human beings are socially empowered over others to such an extent that it's very, very difficult for us to even recognize, much less do anything about these converging crises. Because, well, just the most obvious example is the fossil fuel industry. You know, they enjoy a great deal of economic and political and social power as a result of the product they sell and their economic model and, and so on. But they block efforts then to do anything about climate change or, or some of these other problems. And that's, that's how social power works. You know, when people become socially empowered, then it's like a, a drug. It acts like a, you know, uh, an addiction to methamphetamine or, or cocaine or something. You want more of it. And people who challenge that power are seen as the enemy and you lash out at them. So even though climate change may threaten the children of the oil executives, the oil executives perceive the immediate threat as the threat to their social power. And so they, rather than acting on behalf of, of their grandchildren and humanity, they lash out. And this keeps us from being able to do anything. Now, I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole of the, am I pronouncing this right? Is it Fermi or Fermi paradox? Yeah, yeah, Fermi paradox, right. But in chapter six, when you bring that up, that what I wanted to circle back to in our conversation today is you, well, first of all, I guess the paradox is that if there's other intelligent life in the universe, why haven't we seen it? Mm -hmm. You'd think that we would have seen it. And one possible solution, reason for that is that intelligent life uh, is going to, you know, is what, what, what did you say? I've forgotten. I'll let you articulate it. What is the theory that intelligent life might do? <laughs> <laughs> intelligent life uh, destroys itself. <laughs> doesn't sound very intelligent. No, it doesn't sound very intelligent. But, you know, once a species becomes powerful enough to take over a planet, then is it also intelligent enough to understand the limits to its own power? Well, we're running that experiment right now in real time. And so far, the results do not look very, very favorable. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I brought it up because I thought it was uh, interesting that two solutions you presented to that is that at one end of the spectrum, you wrote that the outcomes could be collapse and possible human extinction. So that could be one thing that we're facing. Right. And at the other end, though, it could be self-restraint regarding per capita consumption levels and human numbers, and we could avert collapse. If we're trying to imagine what's ahead, somewhere on this spectrum between those two things, we may find ourselves, or even at either end, right? Right. Yeah. The, the one outcome that I don't explore in the book is the possibility that we'll ab be able to continue economic growth and industrial expansion through the end of this century and even beyond. I just don't see that as a, a likely outcome. I don't, I don't think we have enough resources. Uh, I, I don't think there would be enough of nature left to support people in, the, in that kind of uh, situation. So that's not a possibility I explore. But you're right. The, the two boundaries, if you will, for possible futures are human extinction on one end, and sufficient human self-restraint on the other. And this is a big theme in the book. Can we restrain our own power? Yeah. And there are a lot of people out there who, who take a cynical attitude and say, no, it's, it's, we, people never restrain their own power. It never happens. It's impossible. Nature itself works by, you know, the red and tooth and claw survival of the fittest. So power self-limitation is just a, you know, it's just an illusion. Well, 
I confront that head on in the book and show that in fact, power self-restraint exists throughout nature. It's even in our own bodies in the form of homeostasis. It's a continual moment by moment power balancing act. In ecosystems, there are predator prey balances that are maintained all the time. And within human societies, we found ways going all the way back to hunter-gatherer times, ways to prevent the bullies from arising and taking over, ways to share resources, ways to conserve nature's bounty rather than over-harvesting, all the way up to the present. You know, when, we, when you look at uh, climate negotiations and nuclear weapons treaties and so on, what we're trying to do is limit power in various ways. But then the question is, if we can do that, then why are we in this mess? And again, I think it mostly goes back to fossil fuels because fossil fuels gave us so much power so fast as a species that we developed this idea that the sky's the limit, that in fact, there are no limits, that if we trash this planet, well, we'll just get in spaceships and go off to another planet and, and use the resources there. I mean, that's our mythology as a species today is basically Star Trek, you know, and I, I, I watched Star Trek when I was a kid. I, you know, I, I enjoy it. It's a, it's a great science fiction fantasy, but it's not reality. Reality is we live on this planet. If we trash it, we have no place else to go realistically. There are limits and we have to learn to live within those limits. But again, you know, fossil fuels it created not just the mythology, but the institutions to demand continual growth. The whole idea of consumerism and economic growth is more or less an, I don't know what you'd call it. For economists, it's like an article of faith that the economy always has to grow. There's never a challenge to that idea. Oh well, yeah, among ecological economists, of course, that's, that discussion's been going on for a long time, but they're, they're not serious economists. <laughs> you, you don't read about them on the cover of the Wall Street Journal. Yeah. No, it's all about growth, 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 gotta have more growth. That's the holy grail. Yeah. yeah. And it's driving us off the cliff. Yeah, it sure is, but you seem to, you even give me reason to be a little bit optimistic. And I wouldn't say that you, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's fair to say that you don't, uh, you, you go out of your way not to really make a prediction. I don't think you believe that you know where we're really headed, yeah. which way we're going to go. No, it's it, the, the system is too complex to be able to forecast how it's going to transform itself or... <laughs> come apart at the seams. <laughs> it's just too, it, it is too complex. Yeah. If we like the idea of not coming apart at the seams, but rather cooperating and exercising self-restraint and somehow uh, reinventing ourselves in this positive way, let's talk about that a little bit. How important is trust in that scenario? Oh, it's hugely important. And uh, that's one of the reasons this is such a difficult moment to be an American. <laughs> uh, because my country is experiencing a, a, a meltdown of trust, essentially. I mean, that's what's... We, we, we talk about political polarization, but how that manifests itself is an evaporation of social trust. The, the trust that our friends and neighbors and governments and healthcare workers and so on are all, you know, working together with essentially our best interest at heart. And we can, we can work together. We can, we can discuss things. We can come to agreements. We can solve problems and so on. No, all of that is just going out the window. There's this widespread feeling now that uh, the, the, everyone who's in charge is utterly corrupt, that what we're being told by the news media is a bunch of lies. And therefore, you know, there's no reason for you to follow any guidelines or, or take any, anyone or anything seriously. That's a prescription for societal collapse. And it's, it's not true across the board around the world. Other countries are doing much better in terms of social cohesion. But I have to say what's going on in the U.S. right now does not bode well. 
There are others who, of course, who are saying the same thing. Peter Turchin is someone I, I quote pretty frequently in the book. By training, he's a uh, evolutionary scientist who worked mostly on insects, but having solved a bunch of, uh, you know, really important problems in that field, he turned his attention to something that might be a little more interesting and practical, which is human social evolution. And, uh, and he's busy solving a bunch of theoretical problems there as well. But he's looked at data on hundreds of human societies. He and his colleagues, he, he works with a number of other distinguished scientists. They've built a, a database of quantifiable information about literally hundreds of human societies since the agricultural revolution. And on the basis of all this data, he's able to pick apart patterns and cycles and so on. And so when he looks at the United States today, he sees a lot of warning signs. And he's said this for over a decade now, that, that the, the decade of the, the 2020s is likely to be an extremely turbulent and politically violent period. And we can see it in, uh, unfolding in front of us. So the upshot of all this is, you know, we need to get busy, those of us who see this happening, building trust however we can. And, you know, I see lots of reasons to complain about things that are going on and decisions in government and so on. But overall, I think building trust is more important than having the snarkiest, most contrarian view on the internet. Well, clearly, we need some trust just to run things in the screwed up way that we've been trying to run things. But if we're trying to <laughs> yeah. head head a little bit more toward uh, not utopia, but uh, a little bit more elegant way of organizing ourselves where we might be able to stick around the planet for a few thousand more years, we, I think you, you give me the impression we need even more trust, don't we? Yeah, yeah. If we're going to get to collective survival, we we need a foundation of, of social solidarity to get there. The worst case scenario, which I outlined in the last chapter of the book, which leads to possible human extinction, is what I call all against all. It's where trust it completely vanishes. And as bad things happen, we just blame each other for them. And we gain whatever sense of satisfaction we can from seeing the other side or our neighbors or whoever get their comeuppance. And uh, that's, I have to say, that's a vanishingly little satisfaction in the context of a planet that is being ravaged and a species that's driving itself toward extinction. Well, as I read about your worst case scenario, I found myself thinking, holy moly, we're kind of living that in, in, in some respect. You know, right now it's just in a few places, but do you find yourself thinking that? The election of Bolsonaro in Brazil and Trump in the United States are uh, not just maybe potential causes of collapse, but that they're symptoms that we're in the early stages of collapse. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there are all, all sorts of symptoms you can see all around. I, I try to look for hopeful signs as well. And certainly there are some. There's lots of people out in the streets uh, all over the, the planet, Europe, other countries, maybe a little less so here in the U.S., who are, you know, calling for action on climate change, for example, or action with regard to economic and, and social inequality. All of these things are really important. The, what I think would really help would be to get beyond the silos. Because right now, people who are interested in a particular environmental issue or a particular social issue or whatever tend to campaign just on that issue. And we, we build our nonprofit organizations around issues. And then foundations, which provide the funding for nonprofit organizations, they're interested in particular issues. And so this creates this uh, siloed effect where, you know, nonprofits are competing with each other for limited funding from foundations. Mm -hmm. And that makes them even more siloed. And the result is we're, we're not really cooperating very much yeah. or even understanding each other very well when we talk about these various issues. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things I try to do in the book is show how all of these things are, are connected 
so that there's more of a sense of, uh, you know, joining together, understanding each other and cooperating. You know, the best case scenario is one which I call in the book the emergence of an, an anti-collapse coalition. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I, again, there are signs of this here and there, but I think we have a long way to go. You know, I think that's pretty catchy title. So that could be that that's exactly what needs to be started. And that's what it should be called. <laughs> the Anti-Collapse Coalition, for sure. And that's one of the things that made me feel like you are a hardcore realist, but you find some reasons for us to uh, to believe that uh, it's, it's not over till it's over. Uh, that there is a path before us that yeah. could be beautiful. Eventually. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for using that that word because I talk about beauty quite a lot in the book. Yeah. One of the uh, pieces of research that really caught my attention was from evolutionary biologist Richard Prum, who wrote a wonderful book a couple of years ago called The Evolution of Beauty, building on the work of Darwin, Darwin's second book on sexual selection, which uh, the problem Darwin was trying to understand was the peacock's tail. It's a huge investment for the peacock to grow this big, beautiful tail. But from an evolutionary standpoint, it's not of much survival value. It makes the <laughs> peacock much more obvious to predators. It's the, this wieldy thing it has to carry around with it. So what's, what's the deal? Well, of course, it, it helps the male peacock find a, or persuade a mate you know, to get it on. And nature is full of that kind of deliberate production of beauty for the purpose of sexual selection, flowering plants, birds, uh, mammals, you know, it's all through nature. And in fact, we look at nature and we think, well, gee, that's really pretty. But in fact, nature is doing this deliberately. You know, nature is putting an enormous amount of resources into making itself as beautiful as it possibly can be. And, uh, and we humans invest a lot of, of effort into aesthetic endeavors as well, music and art, architecture, dance, you know, poetry, jokes, on and on and on. But I think a lot of that has been hijacked for commercial purposes uh, to the point where it could be described as aesthetic decadence. Yeah, yeah. Because it's, it's tending to drive us, you know, it's just helping drive the ship toward, you know, uh, unsurvivable economic expansion, uh, industrial expansion. So, what I propose in the book is the possibility that our outsized powers as human beings, our tool making, our control of fire, our uh, ability with language, all of these things, these marvelous abilities could be put to use instead of, you know, as taking over the world and destroying our own future. We could put these to use in making the world an even more beautiful place than it already is through the deliberate production of beauty. And traditional cultures did this. They, you know, they, they invested a lot of effort in the production of beauty and in the deliberate destruction of surplus that might otherwise be reinvested in activities that would, you know, create ecological imbalance. So potlatches, uh, the, you know, annual feasts where surplus was deliberately destroyed or consumed and shared. These are the traditional human ways of keeping things in balance. But of course, in the modern world, if we have surplus, we reinvest it so as to create even more growth, more jobs, more tax revenues, more returns on, on investment, more profits for, for business and so on. And you know, to modern economists, this is all the way things should be. But from a long-term perspective, an ecological perspective, and, and even an anthropological perspective, this is perverse activity, and it's getting us into very, very deep trouble. Well, thanks for that. Final question, Richard. I'm sure that you're hoping that this book might have some impact. So what's your vision? Is your vision that uh, it gets passed around at the American Enterprise Institute and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and Rupert Murdoch <laughs> <laughs> reads it? Who needs to read it? How, does, how is it going to make a difference? <laughs> yeah, it's my effort 
to shift the conversation. Because right now, the conversation is largely dominated by techno-optimists who are saying, yeah, we got these problems with social inequality and climate change and species and so on. Sure. But the way to solve it is with more economic growth. So we have more surplus so we can, you know, throw a few more dollars at wind turbines and solar panels. Uh, the way we solve it is with more economic growth. So the economic pie gets bigger. So even if we do have a few rich people who have these huge slices of the pie, then even the poorest people will have a little bit bigger slices than they have right now. But, you know, I'm calling bullshit on that. You know, I'm saying, look, the only way we're going to solve these problems is to confront power per se, to reduce our human power over the natural world, leave space for other species, reduce our energy usage, reduce our population, and then reduce social inequality through reducing the social power of the people who have the most. That means, you know, the billionaire is getting taxed at a far higher rate. It means redistribution of resources so that the rich countries are less rich vis-a-vis -vis the poorest countries. If we don't do that, then the worst case scenario is, is where we're headed at an ever accelerating rate. Too true. Richard, thanks for doing this, for writing this book, and yeah. for, uh, as always, articulating the important points about these issues so well. Well, thank you, Dave. And uh, yeah, let's bust that growth. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate you doing your part. If Richard Heinberg is right, and I have no reason to doubt him, taking the desirable path forward will be extremely challenging. The odds are stacked against us based on what I'm seeing. Here are three very brief passages from the book once again. Some may not want them to be true, but I don't think anyone who's familiar with limits to growth and overshoot would argue with them. Averting collapse would require all three strategies, managed population decline through fewer births, reduction in per capita consumption of energy and materials, and a thorough efficiency overhaul of just about everything we do. We must all aim for a relatively simple life that's attainable by everyone and that's able to be sustained without harming ecosystems. And we could learn to focus our attention on beauty and happiness rather than acquisition of material wealth. We could excel in self-control rather than seeking to further control nature and other people. All right, that's it. Check the show notes for links to the book, Richard Heinberg's newsletter, and especially the link to the crowdfunding project to make the Growthbusters documentary free. Fundraiser.com slash Growthbusters movie. That's F-U-N-D-R-A-Z-E-R. -E Please visit the site, pitch in, and encourage people in your network to join you. And do it before the end of October 2021. Thanks for listening. Some may dream to paint mountains and streams, but not me. I'm a growth buster. Some may just want more, but don't know what it's for, but not me. I'm a growth buster. Don't want a solution at the cost of pollution. They think bigger is better at the cost of the weather. But no, not us. We are the growth busters. Calling, 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 calling. Call the growth busters. Whoa.